Okay, now we're going to continue with the program and um, this next phase, enhancing public and private partnership to prevent elder fraud, is going to be moderated by my colleague from the Eastern District of New York, Richard Donahue, who's the U.S. Attorney there, and also he's a fellow Army JAG veteran. So oh. I'll, I'll let you take it over from here. Okay. All right, good afternoon. It's an honor to be here. Uh, while we have our panel members settling in, I'll do some quick introductions in alphabetical order. Uh, first up, we have uh, Gus Eiler. Gus is the director of the U.S. Department of Justice's Consumer Protection Branch. He supervises criminal and civil litigation to protect Americans' health, safety, economic security, and identity integrity. He previously served as counselor to U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions and as a prosecutor in the Criminal Division Fraud Section and the U.S. Attorney's Office in the District of Maryland. Before joining the Justice Department, he worked at an international law firm as a Senate counsel and as a law clerk. Gus is a graduate of Princeton University and Yale School of Law. We will not hold that against you, Gus, I promise. <laughs> Next up, we have uh, Patrick Helley. Uh, Patrick is the Senior Vice President of Policy and Advocacy at U.S. Telecom, the Broadband Association. He leads the association's policy development and advocacy efforts before the White House and Executive Branch regulatory agencies, courts, and other government entities. He's responsible for leading the efforts of U.S. Telecom's industri industry traceback group, a collaborative effort of companies that actively trace and identify the source of illegal robocalls. Next up, we have Juan Hardo Hardoy. Uh, Juan is the Assistant General Counsel in Microsoft's Digital Crimes Unit where he fights technology facilitated crime against vulnerable populations, including children and elderly persons. He manages the Digital Crime Unit's global field operations and oversees the company's field enforcement and intelligence efforts against organized criminals and illicit organizations engaged in cybercrime. Before join joining Microsoft, Juan worked with law firms in both Argentina and in New York, and he's a graduate of the University of Buenos Aires Law School. Next, we have Donald Ravina. Donald is the president of Seniors vs. Crime, Inc., a nonprofit corporation located in Newport Ritchie, Florida. He also serves as the executive director of the Seniors vs. Crime Project, a special project of the officer, Office of the Florida Attorney General that provides direct services to law enforcement and senior citizens through the use of senior volunteers. Mr. Ravina, joined Seniors vs. Crimes in July of 2000 as a regional director and was appointed by the board of directors to his current position in March of 2002. He served in the U.S. Navy and as a Vietnam veteran. He served with the Vermont State Police for 26 years, retiring after reaching the rank of Major Staff Operations Officer. And finally, from Bank of America, we have Craig Tim. Craig's been at Bank of America since 2016 as a managing director in the Global Financial Crimes Unit. He is responsible for strategic initiatives and government engagement. Prior to joining Bank of America, Mr. Tim worked in the U.S. Department of Justice, most recently as a deputy chief in the Criminal Division's Asset Forfeiture and Money Laundering section. He has an undergraduate degree from the University of Michigan and a law degree from Northwestern University School of Law. So welcome to our panel members today, and thank you for being here. We have a lot of ground to cover in a relatively short period of time, so we're obviously only going to hit some highlights today. But, Gus, I'd like to start with you. As the director of DOJ's Consumer Protection Branch, you are deeply involved in the day-to-day -day work. CBP does a lot of work both on the civil and criminal sides to protect Americans, particularly seniors, from fraud. I'd like to ask, what is the department doing to help protect our seniors and to work with partners to prevent Americans from becoming victims of fraud? Thank you, Rich. Um, can you all hear me? Uh, thank you for staying with us here this afternoon. We appreciate it. Um, so as Rich noted, uh, the Consumer Protection Branch has about 200 uh, trial attorneys, investigators, and staff personnel. Uh, these are dedicated professionals uh, who strive uh, to take a number of actions to protect consumers, both res with respect to anti-fraud efforts, um, but also efforts related to drug and product safety, um, and other uh, concerns, uh, consumer data privacy is a major issue for us 
right now, ensuring that information that consumers give out remains safe. Uh, in the fraud context, um, as Rich noted, we do work both on the civil and criminal side of the House, um, which is a, a unique aspect of our practice, and we work with our U.S. Attorney's Office colleagues across the country, and it's really through those partnerships um, that we are able to develop and pursue the type of multi-district uh, and, <coughs> and multinational cases that we bring. Um, working with offices like Rich's office uh, in the Eastern District of New York um, and, and others around the country, we have in the past two years under Attorney General Barr uh, and, and Assistant Attorney General Hunt post, uh, placed a particular focus on uh, foreign fraud schemes. Um, what we have seen is an explosion in growth in these schemes uh, recently where individuals who are based in call centers uh, in other countries, uh, often India, Philippines, uh, West Africa, uh, will set up call centers that can have thousands of people working in them who are barraging Americans every day with phone calls or other lures to try and get them hooked into a scheme uh, and get them to send their hard-earned money uh, overseas. Um, so we've set up uh, data tools where we're pulling together data sources from around the country uh, and applying uh, sophisticated analytics to try and spot the trends and, and outliers that are the indications of fraud so that we can pursue them. But then, in a really critical partnership, we are working with those here at the table. Um, these are industry partners of ours in the banking industry, the telecommunications industry, the tech industry, and the retail industry who are working with us to help provide information that we can use to develop investigations and bring prosecutions. And they're applying their resources and their know-how to make our efforts more effective. And that development has been something that is a real game changer for us uh, and something that I'm excited for you to hear from our partners here today about the good work that they are doing, putting their you know, corporate know-how uh, and resources behind an area that all of us agree is something of great importance uh, and, and, and needs to be pursued. Thank you, Gus. Uh, it's no surprise to anyone here that this is a massive problem. Gus talked about some of the international aspects of this and the partnerships. And I think we all agree that partnership is the key to addressing a problem of this scope and scale. Um, one of the most important parts of that partnership and one of the most important partners we have our seniors themselves. So I'd like to go to Donald next to talk a little bit about a very unique organization that I think is just fantastic, Seniors Versus Crime. Donald, can you tell us a little bit about the organization and what Seniors Versus Crime does to help prevent people from becoming victims of fraud? You'll hear me better with this, I guess, huh? Okay. <laughs> seniors Versus Crime started in 1989. It was a result of a uh, task force that the Attorney General at that time, Bob Butterworth, chaired that uh, toured the state of Florida looking for things that were affecting seniors. And they, the legislature decided that he should do something to help all seniors, but he gave them no money to do it. Very unusual for the state. <laughs> so, we ended up with this idea of seniors versus crime. We decided we were going to have seniors become involved in their own protection. All right, it started up as a, uh, a 501c3. It operates as a special project of the Florida Attorney General's office. The key project, the, the key feature of the project was enlisting seniors that wanted to help other seniors. We started off doing just crime prevention for seniors. Then in 2001, we decided to open an office where seniors could come in and lodge a complaint with us. It was a pilot project in the Delray Beach area. Uh, after one year of operation, we recovered over a million dollars for seniors. And we decided, all right, we've got to expand this statewide. We don't have any money. So how do we expand it statewide? Well, we hooked up with, this, with police departments throughout the state, with the uh, sheriff's offices throughout the state, and with senior centers 
in even Sun City Center. We have an office right out here on Cherry Hills. So they donate office space to us. We bring in the volunteers. The volunteers take any complaint that comes through the door. We charge absolutely nothing for it. If we recover $5 for you, you get $5. If we recover $5,000, you get $5,000. We take nothing. We're one of the few things in life that are truly free. All right, uh, the offices have expanded now. We're up to 38 offices around the state from Pensacola down to the Keys. Um, you can contact us by an 800 number. We've got a website where you can lodge a complaint. You can request a speaker from our Speakers Bureau to, to uh, address your people. Um, and you can apply to become a senior sleuth. Do all that right online. Or you can stop at our table that's right out back here. You walk through the doors out to the right, and Seniors versus Prime has a table out there with a lot of good information on it as to how you get in touch with us, how you get a speaker, etc. This year we recovered a, um, around $2 million for seniors that had been defrauded in the state of Florida. We take any case that's a civil case that normally you'd be told, well, you gotta take this guy to small claims court. It's not enough that the state's attorney's gonna handle it. So you'd be falling through the cracks. Well, most people aren't gonna go to small claims court. So they come see us and for free, we'll mediate your case for you and we're usually quite successful. Over 52% of the cases that we take in result in a recovery for the senior that was complaining. Okay, so look us up online, look us up on the uh, materials that are out back and take advantage of us. We're free, we're here for you, and we'll do a good job. Thanks. Great. Thank you, and it's a great organization. And if you have some uh, free time and an urge to get in the fight, I would say certainly uh, please contact them and, and offer your services as well as your insights. Uh, Patrick, let's talk a little bit about U.S. Telecom and U.S. Telecom's role. So many of the fraudulent schemes that we see start with a telephone call. It's someone pretending to be from a bank or another financial institution. It might be someone pretending to be a grandchild or a friend of a grandchild, a family member who's in trouble. Um, and these conversations, sadly, often end up with people losing money. What can we do to stop these schemes and prevent people from becoming victims from the U.S. telecom perspective? Sure. So, unfortunately, with the illegal robocall scams, there is no single thing that anybody can do uh, to solve this problem. And so, truly, is an, an all-of-the-above strategy that matters, both government, industry, and individual consumers taking steps to prevent uh, the harms that come from illegal robocalls. Uh, both the Attorney General Barr and Attorney General Moody this morning talked about um, the, the growing use of technology to scam consumers, and it's true. Um, especially as we're in this, this internet-based economy that we're in right now, um, there are so many benefits to consumers from modern technology and so much information that we're able to find to help us in a, in a helpful manner because of the internet. And I think overall, uh, with any technology, technology revolution, you have a lot of significant benefits, but there always come negative consequences, unfortunately. And I'm sure my colleagues at the table can talk about that from their perspective as well. One of the problems for, one of the consequences is, is how easy it is to make a robocall now. Um, it's very inexpensive using an internet platform to generate tens of millions of calls essentially simultaneously. Um, and so that means it's easier for the bad guys to target uh, uh, individuals. So let me just give you, let me frame the problem real quick. R estimated in February of this year that 4.8 billion robocalls were made to U.S. citizens. That's a lot. Uh, almost 30 million already, in, already this year. Um, 16.5 million per day, almost 7 million an hour. In Florida in February, there was an, it's an estimation that there were 362 million robocalls. Now, they're not all bad, right? Some of them are calls from your pharmacy or from your doctor's office or from a utility to let you know that the power's out. So there are good robocalls. The problem is, how do you know which ones are good and which ones are bad when there's so many? Um, and there was one estimate that about 42% of the robocalls that we're seeing are scams. So 42% of 4.8 billion in February is an awful lot of robocalls that are associated with scams. Uh, so what do we do about it? Uh, well, as I said, it takes, it takes an all of the above strategy. 
the, the, the phone company industry certainly has to step up and do as much as they possibly can to protect consumers, uh, and, and we are. So the, the groups I work with are you know, AT&T and Verizon um, and Frontier and companies like that, and then also wireless carriers and cable companies, all of whom offer telephone service. Um, so from the industry side, um, let, let me, maybe it helps to just explain how this works just to give you a sense. Um, the Attorney General talked about the uh, robocall scams that were starting in India earlier this morning. A lot of the illegal robocalls that are impersonating the SSA or impersonating the IRS originate in India. Uh, but they don't all. I mean, there's plenty of robocall scams that start in the United States as well, just to be clear. Um, so what do you need to, to do it? You, you, you need somebody who wants to make these calls, right? There's some entity who, who has a list of phone numbers that they're going to make and they're going to target communities, whether that's first-generation Americans, um, elderly Americans, um, you know, they have different ways to target different communities. So you have an interested party. They have to have somebody, in this case in India, who's willing to make the calls, right? To put them on some sort of an internet-based platform and make a bunch of phone calls at once. But they can't get onto the network in the United States unless there's a willing company in the United States to take that traffic and put it onto our telephone network. Um, and so when you get an illegal robocall, right, it's, it's somebody who's calling you and is trying to scam you out and pretending they're the Social Security Administration or the IRS, the company, your, your provider, whoever it may be, let's say it's Verizon Wireless or AT&T, they have no relationship whatsoever with any of the entities that are making those calls, and they have no idea who it is. So one of the things that we're doing, as you mentioned the industry traceback group, and this is important, is we set up a process whereby we can quickly, usually within hours now, figure out which entity it was that actually either allowed the traffic onto the US network or sometimes even what, who the entity was in India that gave them the traffic. And the reason that this is more complicated than you might think is, you know, if you pick up the phone to call your, your brother or your sister, and, and you're a Verizon customer and you're calling them and they're a, you know, a, a T-Mobile subscriber, let's just say, the call doesn't go from Verizon to T-Mobile. The call goes from Verizon and just says that because of the way our, our telephone system works to one company who passes the call on to another company, who passes the call on to another company, and then ultimately it gets delivered to the T-Mobile subscriber. So T-Mobile, so when, 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 when your carrier gets the call, they have no idea who it originated from. They only know who the, the call, who, who the entity in that chain, the last one was, and that sent it to them. So what do they do? They can't do it on their own. So we coordinate with all of the carriers across the entire system. There are hundreds of them. So that when we get a f evidence of a fraudulent call, whether that comes from your attorney general, whether that comes from the fraud department of a phone company, whether it comes from one of our, our partners that gives us recordings of fraudulent r robocalls, we launch it into a system. We, we tell the carrier who received the call, who did you get this from? They tell us it was you know, company A. Who did you get it from? Company B. Who did you get it from? Company C. And then they tell us, oh yeah, this is the entity that originated that phone call. Well, what do we do with that? We refer it to the Department of Justice, or we refer it to the state AG, or we refer it to the Federal Trade Commission, or we refer it to the FCC. We have a list where we just provide this information. And I've never been so excited to get subpoenas as I am in my current job. Um, because I welcome them. Subpoena us, and we'll tell you what we know. Um, and we can't trace back every call, but we trace back a lot, and it's and representative of tens of millions of phone calls. So that's what we're doing, which no consumer would ever have any idea was going on in the background. And the cases that you heard about this morning with hundreds of millions of illegal robocalls targeting American consumers, part of that was because we were able to provide information to the Department of Justice and to the Social Security Administration so they knew who to go after. Um, and it's probably the most rewarding aspect of the work that I do, to be honest. Um, the second piece industry is doing is just trying to empower consumers with tools. So you've heard a lot today about how some of these scams work and you know what you should do and we can talk more about that if you do get a call but you should also be aware that your provider whoever it is provides tools to block robocalls or to label calls so that you might see something on your phone that says likely scam or something like that so in addition to sort of being educated on what to do when you get a call i also really encourage you to learn about what the different tools are that your provider offers uh, to block or label calls that are likely illegal um, and, and there are also many different tools that you can download over the top, for example, as an application, uh, that type of service. Uh, but more than happy to go into more details on any of those as well. Thank you, Patrick. You've been a great partner in this. As the U.S. attorney who oversees the robocall cases brought lately, 
I can say that the, the traceback information is absolutely essential. And if you look at the complaints that are filed in those two civil cases, you'll see that the bulk of the data that we have is traceback information. That's how we were able to identify who was bringing those calls from overseas, in our cases, India, into the United States to be, to be uh, fed into the system. So thank you for that. Of the uh, 4.8 billion calls I think you mentioned, I, I might have gotten more than my fair share. Um, to show how prevalent it is, we had Deputy Attorney General Jeff Rosen in our office a couple weeks ago in Brooklyn, and we were having a, an all-office meeting, sort of a fireside chat, and we were talking about the importance of the robocall initiative and the elder fraud initiative generally. And literally while I was interviewing the Attorney General, I received a robocall, a uh, fraudulent robocall, while we were discussing the problem. So uh, it was a good indicator of, of how much work there is to be done, but how important this is as well. Um, Craig, I'd like to turn to you. I know that Bank of America has taken a leading role to protect its customers from fraudulent schemes. Can you tell us a little bit about what the bank is doing, what banks generally can do, and what you advise your customers to avoid becoming victims of fraud? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And let me first say um, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to, to work with the Department of Justice. Uh, Sun City Center um, is, has a particularly fond spot, spot in my heart. Uh, my grandfather's lived here for over 20 years. He's 89 years old. I'll go see him as soon as we're done here. So it's great to be back here. You know, as a financial institution, um, you know, we have a unique ability to see potential elder abuse because you know, we're where the money is, and, and therefore a unique ability to help. And, and when we think of the ways that we can help, I, I really sort of think about it in three different buckets. So first, prevention. You know, that's obviously the number one goal. Can we stop fraud before it starts? You know, second, you know, knowing that we're not going to prevent every case of fraud, um, you know, how can we detect it when it does occur and make sure we report it to the department and the right state authorities when we do see it? And then lastly, how can we help victims get their money back? When there is a fraud, you know, what can we do on our end to try to stop the money or, or find the money? And I'll talk a little bit about each of those. First, in, in terms of prevention, uh, you know, education is, is really the key here. And um, you know, we have a lot of great materials out there that are generally available, publicly available uh, on our website. Uh, we partner with the AARP. But what we find is most effective is education at the time when it matters, so at the moment of truth, so right when you're about to make that transaction. So part of the way we do that is through technology, looking for anomalies, an odd payment that you know, is way out of whack for what, what a client normally does. But another way we do it is through educating our employees so that they're trained to recognize these scams and so that when someone comes in you know, and says, look, I need this money right away, uh, you know, my grandson's been kidnapped and I've got to pay them right away, that they recognize that's a potential scam and that they're trained to know what to do with it and, and, and know how to handle it and, and can have that conversation. The other resource we try to give all of our clients and, and our employees is, uh, you know, we give all of our clients the opportunity to give us a trusted contact. So before the moment when you're scammed, we ask for, you know, give us the name of someone you trust, and the only time we'll ever call this person is if you think you're a victim of a scam. You know, it could be a friend, colleague, son, daughter, family member, doesn't matter who, but so that, you know, when we see the grandparent come in and we see them flustered and they're adamant that they need this money to get their grandkid out of the hospital. Um, we've got somebody we can call and we can use them as an advocate for you to help us try to convince you that, that maybe this isn't actually what it appears to be. Thank you. And then I think the, the last thing about education, um, you know, we've talked a, bit, a little bit about it here and then you know, Attorney General Moody mentioned it earlier, we have these silos and so one of the things we've been working with Gus and his team a lot on is, is how can we raise the tide across the financial industry? So not just at Bank of America, but, but everywhere else. And so you know, we've started meeting regularly with my colleagues at other banks, sharing what we do, what's working, what's not, you know, with an effort of, you know, it's great if, if we can stop it at Bank of America, but they're just gonna walk across the street to another bank, right? So how can we attack this as an industry? And I think more and more we're thinking across industries, right? How can we collectively work on this with the government, with the private sector, to really make a difference across the board and, and really raise the tide. So that's the that's the prevention aspect. So so next is you know obviously we're we're not going to prevent everything. You know how can we detect it, and when we do, how can we report it? And so this is this is another area where technology is really allowing us to be a lot better than um, than we were before. You know you'll hear fancy terms like behavioral analytics or machine learning or artificial intelligence. 
And really what all of that does is allow us to see something unusual, right? You know, your transaction pattern, you know, think about your own, what you do with your money, it's probably pretty regular. And if all of a sudden there's a large wire transfer to a country known for fraud, that's probably gonna stand out a little bit. And so that's what we use this fancy technology to try to help us find. So that before that wire goes through, or, or if there's a series of wires, you know, eventually we catch those payments. You know, if we see, you know, all of a sudden, you know, $700 repeatedly being withdrawn for legal fees, maybe we can see that. Maybe we can have a conversation. And maybe we can then bring in your trusted contact to help with that conversation. Uh, and, and then importantly after that, you, you know, it, it, whether, we can, whether we can stop it or not, it's getting that information to the hands of people who can do something. So it's getting it to the Department of Justice um, to see if they can attack the network. It's getting it to the state authorities, the adult protective services in the state um, to make sure. And then, you know, we have a team of investigators who do nothing but elder abuse cases. It's their full-time job, it's a large team, and they're trained, one, to recognize a scam, uh, two, how to deal with victims, how to have a conversation, how to, you know, oftentimes it's not something, um, you know, the victim wants to hear at first. So how do you deal with that? How do you have that conversation? And then also how to work for, for our law, with our law enforcement partners to make sure that the information we have gets in the right hands. And then lastly, you know, it, it's, it's how to get money back from, from victims. And I think this is, you know, we've talked about this today. You know, unfortunately, there, there's still a stigma um, that victims feel um, when they're scammed. But, but these criminals, are, you know, are so sophisticated today. They're so good. You know, there shouldn't be a, a, a stigma, right? This could happen to any one of us. And the faster you can report it, the faster, you know, the better there's a chance that you might get your money back. And there's certainly a much higher chance that somebody else will be stopped from doing it. So, you know, I, I'd ask that, you know, right after you make that call to the, the department's number, call your bank, let them know. You know, if, if the money's left our bank, you know, we can call another bank and try to see if we can get it back. I, I can't promise you we will, but I can promise you if you don't call, the fraudsters are gonna move fast and they're gonna move it. So, you know, I think I'll, I'll just wrap by saying, you know, uh, you know our, our purpose is to, you know, make the financial lives of our clients better. And, you know, there, there's not much I can think of that makes their financial lives worse than, than, you know, being the victim of fraud. And so this is something that, you know, when it comes to our top priorities as a company, you know, it's right up there and, and will continue to be. Thank you, Craig. You know, as Craig just indicated, technology is such an important part of the solution here, and the technology infrastructure that Bank of America and other companies are building is both remarkably effective um, and does a great deal to prevent uh, people from becoming victims in, in the first place. In fact, a couple years ago, I was in Brazil. Uh, I happened to be a Bank of America customer. I made the mistake of not telling them I was going to be in Brazil. I made a purchase in the store uh, using my Bank of America card, and as I was walking through the door, my phone rang, my cell phone rang. It was my wife saying, Bank of America just called. There was a purchase in Brazil. They want to hear from you that you're actually in Brazil. It was remarkable. It was literally within moments of that card being swiped in Brazil that there was a call to my home, kick to me in Brazil, and, and confirmation. So you can see how effective those programs really are. Um, let's talk a little bit more about technology. One, Microsoft products and service are, services are in hundreds of millions of homes and businesses across the United States. We know that fraudulent schemes that do not begin with a phone call very often begin with an email or another electronic communication. From Microsoft's perspective, what can people do to safeguard their digital identity and protect themselves from losing both their information and their money? Thanks, and let me first say also that it's great to be back in Florida, okay? I consider Florida my home. I lived here several years with my wife and five kids in Key Biscayne, Florida. I now live in Seattle, but it's great to feel the sun on my face again. <laughs> and You'll see the sun in a few months out there, don't worry. <laughs> and uh, as we used to say in Key Biscayne, you can leave the key, but the key never leaves you. So I guess you're gonna see me around again at some point. Um, let me first start by saying that every seven minutes we receive a customer complaint in Microsoft about tech support scams. That's a lot. Since we started recording those calls, uh, those uh, reports in our uh, uh, report a scam portal, we received 700,000 of those complaints. That's a lot of complaints. So since we started this meeting, five more people were scammed uh, by criminals impersonating the Microsoft name. And this is just Microsoft. Uh, it's an industry-wide problem. These bad guys are impersonating the names of many other tech companies. 
um, and obviously other reputable brands and the government. So what do we do about it? <clears throat> Through advanced analytics and investigations of all those calls we get or complaints, we identify the largest players behind those scams and send that information to the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission so that they can be disrupted and brought to justice. <clears throat> um, but I think the, the financial aspect is also key because let me give you some numbers about the economics of the crime to, to, so that you can see the scale of the problem and the complexity of the problem. And I couldn't agree more with the other speakers that we cannot fight this problem alone. We need everybody to join the fight. Um, if you invest a dollar in one of these fake call centers in India, you'll probably make $12 in return. There's, what, 1.4 billion people in India, and the unemployment rate in India is 50%. Uh, and then the risk of persecution in India is very, very low. So, you know, high profits, low risk of persecution, uh, that's really bad for this type of crime or for the proliferation of crime. So how do you invert the equation? Well, working on deterrence continues to be important, but also uh, disrupting the criminal infrastructure is key because we're not gonna rest our way out of the problem. Um, so in Microsoft, recently we decided to take a more proactive action and uh, started calling these bad guys who say they're Microsoft. So our investigators are starting to call them before they are able to engage with you. And we say, well, my computer screen uh, has a, a pop-up uh, on the screen that says that uh, my computer is infected. The same computer pop-up you would get at home, we get, we collect. And we call that number and say, what do we do? We engage with them, we collect information that then pass on to the financial services industry to a major credit card and to banks so that those merchant accounts can be disrupted and the money, the account can be canceled or suspended and the money be sent back to the victims via the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, an independent agency of the Federal Reserve System. The FTC is also doing a fantastic work in uh, getting money back to victims. Um, but that's, we face the same problem as the um, telecommunications industry. Uh, there's hundreds of thousands of pop-ups on computer screens, and some of them are malicious, many are not. And we're a small team in Microsoft, the Digital Crimes Unit, so what do we do? So our engineers and in the DCU, in the Digital Crimes Unit, we have mostly engineers. I'm a lawyer, but most of us are engineers. And uh, we decided to use and do what we do best, which is use technology to fight the problem. So our team of engineers developed a system that is basically, let's teach the computer to identify and think like an investigator, identify a pop-up that's malicious versus one that's not with a high level of confidence and then, then give that information to our investigators so that they can place those calls and that they can provide also the information to the Department of Justice. Um, so basically what we're doing is using artificial intelligence we're using the computer. The computer is thinking like an investigator to do part of the work of the investigator. Um, we then filter those out and are able to narrow down the number of uh, malicious pop-ups. And hopefully before they call you, we are able to call them. But it continues to be critical that we get those reports, that law enforcement gets those consumer reports, and that also you report it to us or the, to the financial services industry or the telco industry, so that we can work together to disrupt them. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. So in a moment, I'm gonna throw it out to our panel for any concluding comments that you wanna make, but I think there are two takeaways from this, and we would, I think, collectively recommend to people that Two things you should do should you get an email, a call, or any other communication that's suspicious is first, 
be skeptical. You should be skeptical of anything you receive, no matter how urgent it seems. And in fact, the more urgent it seems, the more skepticism you should apply. So first, please be skeptical. And second is don't make any immediate decisions or take any immediate actions. There's nothing so urgent that you need to immediately go to a store and buy a bunch of uh, cards and then respond with the card numbers or make a wire transaction from your bank account or anything of that sort. Uh, if you think this may be a legitimate communication of some sort, you take the information and then you go and you contact maybe your bank, perhaps your telephone company or your technology company directly through their main points of contact rather than the, uh, the email address or uh, website link or phone number you may have been provided in the earlier communication. If there is a legitimate concern or a legitimate problem, your service provider will be help, help you address that. Okay, so skepticism and please don't take immediate actions are probably the two takeaways that we can give people to help prevent them from becoming victims of fraud. So with that, we just have about two minutes left. I will open it up to our panelists who can talk a lot more about this if we had more time, but are there any final thoughts? I know, Patrick, you indicated that you would have some comments about what people should do when they receive the call. Perhaps we could start with you. Sure, and you just, you just laid out a bunch of them. I, I agree completely with what you said about being skeptical, uh, especially if it's a number you don't recognize. I mean, I'm hesitant to say this, but if you don't recognize the number, I question whether you should answer it at this point, which is a shame because we've lost trust in our phone network. Um, you know, these things that we carry around now, people don't even think of them as phones anymore. They think of them as little computers, which they are, but the telephone network serves a lot of really important purposes. And until we can get this problem in check, people aren't gonna trust it. And that's why it's such a priority for our industry uh, so that we can restore trust in the network. But a couple things, one, consider if, if it's important, they'll leave a message or they'll call you back. Two, never press one. You know what I mean? If, if, if you get a, a phone call from somebody that's saying, press one for more, no. Unless you know the number or it's something you've done before. Three, unfortunately, there's a technology called spoofing, which means the number that is on the caller ID when they're calling you, when somebody's calling you, may not actually be the number that, that's actually calling you. So um, somebody can spoof Microsoft's number. They do it all the time, believe me. I'm sure you're aware of this, <laughs> right? People pretending to be Microsoft and the number comes in and it's a Microsoft phone number. It's not Microsoft. Same with, same with Bank of America and lots of other reputable companies like that. So you may not even be able to trust the number. We're working on that. We're working on technology that will authenticate calls so that non-spoofed calls won't get through. But just be very skeptical. Uh, when you're hearing a recorded voice that's telling you they're from the IRS or the social security number and they're asking you to send them money, that will never happen, okay? So don't send them money when it's from a recorded voice pretending to be the IRS or the Social Security Administration or any other federal agency. I agree with that. We need a healthy, healthy dose of skepticism. In the meantime, we'll keep doing what we can to identify who's making the calls, provide tools to block them from ever hitting your phone, uh, and, and continuing to coordinate with government. And I do. I want to echo the great work that the Department of Justice is doing and the state AGs in this fight. It's uh, it's not easy, but we're we're going to keep working together. You would let, let me adjust one word. We Microsoft won't call you home, okay? We don't make unsolicited calls. If somebody is calling you saying it's from Microsoft, just hang up, hang up and report it. Do not take the call. Thank you. You want to put us all out of business, do exactly what you used to tell your little kids the first time that they went to the grocery store alone to buy a candy bar. What did you tell them? Four simple words. Don't talk to strangers, okay? If you don't talk to strangers, you cannot get ripped off. It's that easy, all right? If it's a phone number and you don't know who it is, you answer the phone and you don't know who it is, you get something on, you get an email on your computer and you don't know who it is, somebody comes up and knocks on your door and you don't know who he is, don't talk to strangers. If you don't talk to strangers, you can't get ripped off. Okay? Thank you. Okay, well, I see that we're out of time, so we want to stay on schedule. I want to thank our panelists, for, both for being here today, but more importantly, for your incredible participation in this partnership to protect Americans. Thank you all. And now it's my honor and, and privilege to give you my friend and colleague from the Southern District of Florida, the United States Attorney for the Southern District of Florida, Ariana Fajardo Horshan. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for staying to the end of our program. 
what an incredible summit. Unbelievable information that we have gathered here today. I want to thank you all for staying here, and I want to encourage all of you to take the information that um, was provided here today, and I want you to share it, share it, share it, and keep sharing it. So I am the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of Florida. My district is from Fort Pierce all the way down to Key West. And this issue, like A.G. Barr said, is not only important for me because I am a prosecutor in the uh, Department of Justice, it's also personal to me. Just after my father unexpectedly passed away, my stepmother got a call from FPL that the FPL bill hadn't been paid. And she was going to Walgreens getting these little cards. And the lady at Walgreens said to her, ma'am, this is a scam and I'm not selling any more cards. So of course the guy on the phone said, well now go to CVS. So she went to CVS and got the cards. And of course when she got nervous and couldn't read the numbers on the cards after the first card, she then called my sister who's a doctor. Now why would you do that, right? You have a lawyer in the family who's a prosecutor, right? Um, my sister called me, she's like, sister, this is what's happening. I said, hang up the phone right now. And she's like, it's a scam, right? And I said, hang up the phone. So it is a personal issue and we need to be cognizant of it because for some reason the calls come when we're most vulnerable. So we need to share that with people because we all need to be conscious of what's going on with our surroundings and we need to educate people. And that's the only way people are gonna understand. So our district is also, I know Maria, you say that you're leading the fight on elder care uh, justice and prosecution of these cases, but I have to give a shout out to my elder justice coordinator, Louis Foster Sears too. Um, <laughs> In, in the last 12 months, uh, our office has indicted numerous cases. Um, unfortunately, the losses have exceeded in excess of a billion dollars. Um, it's not a number to be proud of. But in regards to what we're doing, we are trying to do hard work and get these cases prosecuted. It's really unfortunate that the loss is really so high. But what's important here is we can't do it alone. As you saw on these panels, and this panel was terrific as far as information, and this is a perfect example of how it takes a village. We can't do it alone. Law enforcement can't do it alone. So please share information. Don't be embarrassed. It happens in the best of families. You gotta share your information. You gotta go to people. You gotta tell people, this is what happened to me. Because believe it or not, we may, may not be able to do anything in this particular case, but we start to connect docs, and eventually we can do something in this fight. So please pass along your information. Um, I wanna definitely give a big shout out today to Mr. Cato for coming all the way here and telling us his story. Um, we can't do anything about your loss, but we thank you for sharing the story. It's so important um, that you continue to tell us all about it. And God bless you and your family. And um, may you live a long life and be able to enjoy all the wonderful things that God has blessed you with. Thank you to the many people who came, A.G. Barr, A.G. Moody, and in this fight and what they're doing. Uh, Jody Hunt, uh, as well as Joe Grogan and Kellyanne Conway. Talk about a star lineup here. Tony Bacon, our fearless leader, thank you for putting this all together. My partner in crimes, Larry Keefe and Maria Chapa. We could, Florida is uh, well represented here, as well as the other many U.S. attorneys that flew in from all over the country. And we will all be on a flight to D.C. this evening because we are heading for an opioid cry, um, summit up there for the rest of the week. Um, all the many DOGA uh, people who put this conference together, thank you so much. And one last thing, because I am out of time. What's the number? 833-FRAUD-11. Do not forget that number. Please share it, share it, share it. Take your pamphlets, share it with your friends. Thank you all so much. And please call if you have any questions. Call your local DOJ. Call law enforcement. We're all here to support you. Have a wonderful lunch and a wonderful afternoon.